Gajya Manjana Shalakaya Chakshu Militam Yena Tazmai Shri Guru Vena Maha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadanti Kam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Yuta Padakamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunatam Vitam Tuam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakam Vitamscha Hey Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tabta Kanchana Gorangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Risha Bhanu Sutta Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vamcha Kapa Turubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Vyevacha Patita Nam Bhavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadara Shri Vasari Gaur Bhakta Rinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So first we request the blessings of His Holiness Chandra Muli Maharaj and all the assembled Vaishnavas that we can speak something that will be pleasing to Srila Prabhupada and that will, that will help us on our, on our spiritual journey um, So Maharaj has beautifully explained the first two verses of the Shikshashtakam and now we are on verse number three which is a verse that is often um, recited in classes um, in our temples um, there's um, many different places where, she, where this third verse is mentioned in scripture um, it's also mentioned in Chaitanya Charitamrita Antya Leela this is chapter 20, text number 21. So we'll, we'll begin with this translation. Um, we'll, sing, we'll recite the Sanskrit together, and then we'll go from there. So I'm sure practically all of you will know this verse. So let's just recite it together. Trinada pisa niche na toro apisa his nuna amanina mana de na kirtaniya satahari. So this translation um, by his divine grace Shula Isi Bhaktivedanta Swami Shula Prabhupada Shula Prabhupada Ki Jai One who thinks himself lower than the grass who is more tolerant than a tree and who does not expect personal honour but is always prepared to give all respect to others can very easily always chant the holy name of the Lord So this, this verse is spoken by Sri Chaitanya uh, Mahaprabhu and um, in these verses, in this area of Chaitanya Charitamrita, he is addressing Srub Damodar, um, and he's giving him, and actually in, this, in the flow of these verses, he'll also speak other verses from the Shikshashtakam, and there'll be some verses that he'll give in between the verses of the Shikshashtakam where he's elaborating or making some additional points. This verse is always very interesting because in many ways, in many ways, it is so easy to misunderstand verses and statements within our scriptures. Because we always bring, we bring to the process of hearing and reading, we bring our own mentality. Yeah? You know, um, Prabhupada, he gave to the world this Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita as it is. But in most cases, when we read, in many cases, we're reading Bhagavad Gita as I am. <laughs> By that I mean, we see the world through the eyes of our particular mentality, our particular mindset, often through the lens of our particular anatas or even attachments. Therefore, the process of Krishna consciousness is so beautiful because the Lord recognizes that. He recognizes that when someone is trying to endeavor, help will be required. Therefore, as Maharaj beautifully explained before, it is both Guru, Sadhu and Shastra. All of these things together helps to make sure that we get the precise, deep and proper understanding. And with all of the 
sublime teachings of Krishna consciousness, in, in each of these verses, in fact, the entire philosophy is like an ocean. It is like an ocean. What do I mean by that? There's so much depth to it. The fact that it's like an ocean is a blessing, but it can also be a curse. I'll explain what I mean by that. When you look at the ocean, two things happen. Well, you can do two things in the ocean. One thing we can do in the ocean is we can stay on the surface. If I stay on the surface of the ocean, if you ask me to describe it, I may tell you it's just some water, just some waves. But there will be other people who are in the same ocean, and if they have the association of great personalities, that person can show them this is how you dive deep into the ocean. It's the same ocean. But now that someone is diving deep into the ocean, they experience something different in the same water. Going deep into the ocean, they can see that there are precious stones, there are different kinds of aquatics, different kinds of life, all existing beneath the ocean. So, when we come together like this, one of our duties is to, is to learn to dive. Is to learn to dive deep into the teachings so that we see, we see, that we see more of the depth of what is being given to us. This verse, as we said, is very easy to misunderstand. Because as we come from this material energy, we carry so much of the material energy within us. So what is this verse asking us to do? To be humble. Right? And that, that itself is enough to trigger most people. That yeah. we're being asked to be humble, to be tolerant, not to endeavor for false prestige or prestige, to offer all respects to other people, and to offer all respects to other people, even if they don't respect us. That, ladies and gentlemen, is enough to give most people a heart attack. <laughs> right? that, enough, that by itself is enough to think, whoa. And in many cases, even though it's not spoken about so much, we often have a, an emotional reaction to things that we read. It's not spoken about so much. But sometimes when we read something and we may discount it, that, yeah, that's, that's a nice idea, but it doesn't, really ex it, it doesn't work in this world, right? Well, that's a nice idea, but that's, I don't need to practice it at my stage. Or that's a nice idea, but, you know, really, that, that was written 5,000 years ago. No one needs to do that right now. So we want to offer a different perspective on this verse. So, there's so much that can be said here. I was, um, I was listening to one class, and it was pointing out that even in the first verse of the Shikshashtik, in which Maharaj spoke about, this Bhava Mahadavagni, you know, this blazing forest fire material existence, that, that first verse of Shikshashikam is interpreted or explained in different ways by different Acharyas. Some Acharyas explain that the entire process of Krishna consciousness is explained even in that first verse. And that this Bhava Mahadavagni, this idea of this um, extinguishing the blazing forest fire of material existence, that statement within the first verse of Shikshashikam relates to Nishtha. In addition to that, this third verse of Shikshashikam also relates to nishta. How are the two things connected? It, it, is, it, is, it is our human experience that whenever we are interacting with other people, there are two dimensions to the interaction. One dimension is the activity, and the other dimension is the mood. Okay? So let's just bring these things together. Have you ever been in a situation where someone did something for you which externally was they were, doing, they were helping you in some way, they were giving you something or doing something for you, but because their mood was wrong, you actually felt maybe unhappy or disappointed. Have you ever had the experience? You know, someone, someone gives you a gift and says, you know, here, psh, happy birthday, right? So they practically throw the gift at you. Now, technically, you can say that they gave you a gift. Technically, but we also are sensitive to the mood in which it was done. Because it was done in a dismissive way, because it was done in a rude way, or let's say someone is commiserating you because you didn't do well, you know, you failed some exam or something like that, but the way that they're saying it to you, you can tell that they're actually happy that you failed the exam, right? 
So what we know is it's not just a question of activity. It's a question of mood. And this third verse really goes in that direction. This, this Kirtaniya Sadar Hari, this, this is giving a formula, and this is now very subtle. It is giving an internal formula by which we can achieve a particular outcome or a particular goal. And, and again, it's difficult in the modern world because the modern world is very gross. So in the modern world, everything is about the form, very little is about the substance. So because of the material conditioning, that, that has such a deep impression on our mind that we can come into Krishna consciousness and we can do something very similar. It can again be about the form. I've done this, I've done that. And what we may miss is what's happening internally. What's happening in the consciousness. But the beauty of the teachings is it constantly brings us back to what's happening internally. And this verse shines a spotlight on that internal mood, the internal cultivation. Not just the internal cultivation, but it shines a spotlight on the cult, on, the, on how the mentality also relates to the outcome. This is a, this is a beautiful... It, these, these things are universal secrets of life. We, we don't always appreciate just how deep the teachings are, but these things are universal principles of life. What I mean by that is that where we are in our lives now is due to what, a, a particular mentality that we had previously. You see, you see the connection? I think a certain way, I, then it starts to go into speak, and I start to speak a certain way. And that mentality eventually manifests in the way that I live, the people I associate with, and the situations that I have. It is always born of a certain mentality. And just as that's there on the material plane, that is also there spiritually. In other words, where we are going to end up spiritually is based upon the mentality that we've been cultivating. So this third verse of Shikshashtakam is actually giving us a roadmap, a mental roadmap which will lead us to a particular spiritual destination. Srila Vishnav Chakravali Thakur has explained that this stage of Nishta, at this stage of Nishta, 75% of the impurities within the heart have been destroyed. That is why it relates to this statement, this, this um, extinguishing the blazing forest fire of material existence. The fire, ladies and gentlemen, at Nishta, the fire has been put out. Okay? The fire is out. However, when, the, when you pull out a fire, does everything immediately return to normal? Yes or no? No. When the fire is put out, when, you, when you've just put out the fire, what's still there? There's smoke, there's, there's ashes, there's embers, right? Hot ashes. You touch those hot ashes, you can still burn. So you can say the fire's out, but the job has not been completed. Right? So this is again, this connection. This third verse relates to this nishta. And, it's, and it's, it's so rich and deep with meaning. Because actually, and you'll see this again and again and again, actually the teachings of Krishna consciousness, if one understands them deeply, they're always so practical. When I was looking at this third verse, what spoke to me, at two levels. First of all, we're looking at the relationship with Nam. Kirtaniya Sada Hari. One who does this chanting with this particular mood. That again, look at the formula. An external activity, but with an internal mood. Right? It's giving a formula. One who does a particular external activity with the correct internal mood is going to end up in a particular point in their spiritual life. So, before this nishta stage, before this third verse of Shikshashtakam, we have a lot of work to do. Have you ever felt overwhelmed in Krishna consciousness? Have you, have you ever had that feeling? Have you ever felt that, wow, there's just so much to be done, like, I've got to get this done. And, and so there's, there's two types of overwhelm. It's like, 16 rounds every day? I've got a job, you know, like that, right? And then on top of that, on top of that, if we're even a little bit introspective, there's all the stuff that comes up inside. 
lust, anger, envy, pride, illusion. So sometimes we may look at the teachings and think, how, how is this going to be possible? How are we going to get there? And also we may even look at other people and think, well, it seems that they also get angry. It seems that this person also has this issue. It seems that these people have also, also had these challenges. So how is it going to work? Then it can easily get to the point where everyone thinks, you know what, it's okay. If I just sit away with everyone else, you know, no one's, going very far, no one's going very high very fast. Maybe a few devotees here, but the majority know. But it's okay because we're all on the same level. Everything's cool. Right? Let's have an ice cream. Okay? <laughs> it's easy to think like that. But there's another way of doing things. The other way of doing things is to really try to dig deep and apply. Apply ourselves to see how do I get out of the maze of material existence. That's a secondary thing. And even more, how do I become a high performer in Krishna consciousness? This, this, ver this third verse is the key. This, this stage of Nishta, this third verse, is considered to be a tipping point in the devotee's spiritual life. Because prior to Nishta, it's work, right? We talk, the stage before Nishta is? Anatta Nivriti, right? So we've been, we've been having to deal with so many Anattas, so many internal enemies. Now 75% of the impurities are gone at the stage of Nishta. The stage of it, and therefore, those qualities which are described in this third verse, those are the qualities of a devotee who is at the stage of Nishta Bhakti. In fact, it's again such a beautiful tapestry. See, you will find that the teachings are like a jigsaw puzzle. You'll see that one thing fits to something else which fits to something else. For example, we know there are three stages of devotees. The neophyte is called the what? Kanishta. Kanishta, right? The, then the intermediate is called the? Madhyam. And then the highest level is called the? Uttama. Now let's go back to the neophyte devotee. Again, the word that's used for the neophyte devotee is the? Kanishta. Okay, did anyone ever think about that word? Kan, nishta. Kan means to seek. Kan, nishta. So Kanishta Adhikari is one who is seeking, well, Kanishta Adhikari means one who has the adhikar or the qualification to seek the stage of nishta. That's the actual meaning. And you'll find this again and again also through the teachings. The etymology or the words themselves explain even more about what's going on. Okay? Kan Nishta. One who is seeking the platform of Nishta. Technically speaking, Madhyam begins at Nishta. Technically speaking. Up until that point, one is seeking Nishta. Therefore, one is aspiring or working towards the platform of the Madhyam. Now, this, this third verse... Again, as we said, it has so many, so many deep and wonderful applications. We, as I said, we're trying to get this relationship with Krishna. And as Maharaj beautifully explained before, in order to have that relationship with Krishna, we also have to have a relationship with who? Devotees. Krishna's devotees. Maharaj explained this point earlier. He said, actually, in terms of giving Krishna pleasure, he's most pleased when his devotees are served nicely. Mm -hmm. This third verse has applications for all relationships. And actually, conversely, this third verse indirectly indicates why any relationships become difficult. Huh? Well, I've seen over many years, in both our communities and in the outside world, is that when there are difficulties in relationship, one of the most, one of the most subtle but underlying issues is that I come into the relationship with my own self in the center. Right? I come into the relationship and it's very subtle. You could ask most people, you know, in your relationships with your close friends, partner, whatever, are you putting yourself in the center? Most people would say what? They'd say no. You know, we serve each other, we, we're nice to each other. But there's another subtle level behind this. Okay, and this verse it, it kind of direct, it kind of touches upon these points. This point about humility is is crucial to this, because humility has so many misconceptions, and then there's a proper understanding. So let me ask you: 
in the modern world, let's, let's start with, with the conditioned tendencies of this world. In the modern world, when people think of humility, what do they think it means in the modern world? Low self-esteem, right? Okay, so that's one thing. So, you know, if, if I see someone being humble, the, the material conception is this person's obviously got a problem, they don't value themselves properly. What else? If, if in, the, in the general context, when people think about humility, what are they thinking about? I heard some other comments. Weakness, definitely. Right? The person's a pushover, people can kick them around, treat them badly, etc. Anything else? When, when we think of this word humility, what are people thinking about? Insecure. Absolutely. The person doesn't have a strong sense of self, they can't stand up for themselves as well. Now, let's be honest. Is it possible that devotees in our communities hold on to these material conceptions of humility? Yes. And therefore, will it become an obstacle for us practicing these qualities? Yes. You see how it works? I, I, when I was thinking about this seminar, I thought one thing we, we could do that would really help is to first define what humility is not. Because oftentimes, and this is strange, sometimes people don't talk about it, but they, they think it. Because we have these material ideas of these words, therefore we think, you know what, I love what Prabhupada is saying, but if I practice this, I would just be exploited, manipulated, controlled, taken advantage of. Therefore, let's put the CC to the side for now, okay? Very, very, and it doesn't just happen with this third verse. It happens with so many aspects of our teachings. So many aspects. Again, so it's a real science. If I have a misconception, right? So thinking, feeling, willing. If I have a misconception about what something means, then, it's gonna, then I will feel averse to practicing it. You see? So first I read it or hear about it, it's, it's um, you know, that seems impractical or it seems like it's going to lead to a negative outcome. Therefore, I feel averse. Being humble, being tolerant, ooh, sounds a bit too much, right? So first of all, my conception leads to my feeling and that feeling leads to my activity. So unless we understand properly what we're dealing with here, it is, it is completely understandable that many devotees will think, I'm not going to practice this. I will say all the right things in the temple, in the environment, at the festivals, but in real life, we'll have to put that to one side. What, let's look at the opposite now. Again, looking at this word humility. What is humility in a spiritual sense? Okay, let's try to, let's, let's, let's go in this direction. We're now looking at the spiritual idea of humility and, and this technique you can use in any area of spiritual life. I want to first be aware, am I holding on to a material conception of this spiritual idea? Because if I am, I'm unlikely to practice it. Okay, so then I endeavor a bit more. What is the proper spiritual conception of this idea? How do I understand it in a spiritual way? Why should I practice it in a spiritual way? And what is the fall? In other words, if I practice this properly in a spiritual way, what would be the outcome? Huh? And that will, that will empower us to move forward in our journey and to, and to achieve and receive all the rich, all the rich gifts, realization, transformation, all the bliss that Krishna is promising us in this teaching. Because we're Ananda Maya sat, we're pleasure seeking by nature. So we have to, we sometimes have to change our paradigm about Krishna consciousness to become conscious. Conscious that I'm coming to this process, but I'm not coming to this process of blank slate. I'm coming to this process with many material ideas which now I have to re well, I have to first become aware of and I have to let go of replacing them with a proper spiritual idea. There's a school in Europe and in this school in Europe um, students will come to learn to play certain classical instruments. So what happens is when, when they want to, when they apply for the school, they're given an interview. And so in the interview, one of the questions that they're asked is, have you learned any classical instruments at any other school? And if they say no, they're charged one price. 
if they say yes, oh yeah, I've had you know, 10 years of learning in, in this school, then, they're to then they have to pay more money. They have to pay more money because the school knows because you've got this idea from somewhere else, we're going to have to unteach all that stuff that you have before we can actually give you the proper understanding. So we're like that. Huh? There's certain things to release, certain things to let go of, and, and there's work to be done. But it's a blissful job and, and, the, and the, the fruits are extraordinary. So let's go back to, let's go back to this term humility. Right? Once you chant the holy names of the Lord in a humble state of mind, right? We hear this again and again and again. So, spiritual conception of humility. I'm, I'm going to throw this out to you first. What is the spiritual understanding of humility? I'd like to hear if anyone has any thoughts, any, any, yes? Understanding of our real position. Okay, absolutely. Did everyone hear that? Understanding our real position. So Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita says, Mamaisvam so jiva loke, jiva bhuta sanatana. Manashishtan indriyami, prakritishtani kashati. Mama, eva, amsa. Mama means my, eva means certainly. Amsa means what? Part and parcel. We are one tenth, the scripture says that the soul is one ten thousandth the size of the tip of a hair. We're part and parcel of Krishna, fragmental parts and parcel of Krishna. So definitely, and, and please think about this, right? Because we're going to get you to do some, something to, we're going to give you something to meditate on a bit later on. It, well, probably today, if not, then we'll do it in, in maybe the next session. So first of all, the spiritual conception means to understand our real position, that we're tiny parts and parcels. Have you ever seen someone in, in, in our spiritual communities becoming frustrated when they could not control a situation. Have you ever seen that? Okay. Now think about that. That conception is a sign that we haven't properly understood our position. Huh? If I know that I'm just a tiny part and parcel of Krishna, I can endeavor, absolutely. But if I really understood I'm just a tiny part and parcel of Krishna and I'm not in control of everything, then if I endeavor and it doesn't work out, I would also remain what? I have some detachment. The reason why I'm sharing this is because there are external symptoms which also give us clues as to what's going on inside us. You see? We will, we will see that the pure devotees, they are the most compassionate, but they are also simultaneously the most detached. Because they really understand. Yes, I'm going to endeavor for Krishna, just like Arjuna. Right? Krishna told him, you fight. In fact, he said to him, Arjuna, you see these people on the other side of the, of the army, right? These opposing armies. Don't worry, they're already dead. I've already killed them. So he's saying to Arjuna, don't worry about the outcome. All I want you to do is make the endeavor. That's a symptom of humility. I understand my proper position. And I understand what Krishna's asking me. He's not saying you have to make something happen. Because he's already told us in different places in the scriptures, you're not the controller anyway. Huh? But what he's saying is, you have to endeavor to do what? To serve sincerely. This is the reframing. It's actually a burden to think that everything has to depend upon us. Even certain mental health challenges, psychological issues, for example, anxiety. Anxiety comes when I think that I have to make everything happen. I have to be in control. It has to turn out the way that I want. Then we're very, very anxious. These verses, all the verses of scripture, they actually have the power to free us of so much trouble. You'll see again and again this theme. The teachings that we have, if they're practiced properly with a proper understanding, they, get, they actually free you from so much difficulty. I, I was... I don't know how I came across it. I came across a video recently. And it was a, a Vedic astrologer. And he was explaining what happens when you have enmity towards another person. When you, when you decide this person, when you take a mood of an enemy towards another person. So we know in the scriptures, right? Krishna will tell Arjuna, you should not be, one who's, who's dear to me does not have enemies, right? Meaning that people may think you're an, their enemy, but you shouldn't take them to be an enemy. So, this, this astrologer, he was explaining that when you, take, when you take the position of an enemy, when you have enmity towards someone else, 
you enter into their chart. Right? In fact, when I say you enter into their chart, what it means is you enter into their karma. Yeah? Technically, what happens is when you, take, when you have a mood of seeing, seeing someone thinking, right, I don't like you, I'm, I'm against you. When you have a mood of an enemy, when you have that mood of a feeling that you have some enmity towards someone, you enter into the sixth house of their chart, which is the house of enemies. It's also the house of disease, right? illnesses, so on. And therefore, you're now receiving some kind of karma based upon that, just because you had that mentality towards them. Huh? And you'll find this again and again and again. The teachings, they work on so many different levels. But because it's Siddhanta, what they give you is just a conclusion. Right? Just like a good, like you, you, have, you know, there's long equations, right? So you have, you know, 10 minus 2 add 6 divided by 16 times 0.5. You have all these different things, and then there's an answer at the end. So, Siddhanta is like the answer at the end. Often, the teachings will just say, look, just don't have, don't have friends and enemies. And someone who's very intelligent, they understand, that must be good for me on all levels. So I'm just not going to have friends or enemies. Right? Someone who, who doesn't fully grasp that, okay, I, I get it, but I also want to know how did you get to that conclusion? Okay, then there's also that information as well. But you should know the answer is still correct. Yeah? There's so many things that we don't fully take to heart, and then we will think, oh, but this process is so difficult. And then the question is the process you think is so difficult, the question is actually to what extent am I following this process? So we all chant, going back to this third verse, how many of us chant with, in a humble state of mind? How many of us chant you know, with a mood of you know, tolerance, desiring no honor for ourselves, you know, being willing to give all respects to other people and with no expectation of respect for ourselves? So we have the external part of the formula often. Does it ever, but do we ever introspect? What is my mentality when I'm doing that? Because this can open up a whole new field of our spiritual practice. So we can check the method and we can check the mentality. I'm doing this, let me just take a moment to introspect. What is my mentality while I'm doing it? What is my mentality while I'm doing it? When I was looking at this verse and just doing some research, one of the points that came up was that actually that mentality is meant to be a lifestyle mentality. If I'm intolerant, proud, always desiring prestige, and then it's like, you know, you know, Mangalati, you know, Japa time, and I think I'm gonna suddenly switch. Now it's, t now it's time to chant, I'm gonna suddenly switch on the humility, the, you know, tolerance and stuff. It won't work. Because what I've been doing the rest of the time, that's what I'm conditioning myself towards. So we have this formula, humility. But what is, let's go on, what else? What else is a spiritual conception of humility? So one is understanding our proper position. What else is the spiritual conception of humility? Any other thoughts? Yes. Um, knowing that whatever comes to us is mercy from Guru and Krishna. Yes, yes. Humility, I was making some notes and I'll come back to that point. But yeah, it's, it's, it, humility has a lot to do with, with gratitude. I heard a wonderful point by His Holiness Radha Maharaj. He said that if we're proud, then whatever happens to us, we always, we're never satisfied. We'll always feel, you know, why didn't it happen sooner? You know, someone gives you a gift, it's like, but it's about time, Prabhu. You know, like, you know, didn't you see me how, how hard I've been working? There's a mood of entitlement. If we're proud, whatever we get, we we'll always think we should have got more. Can anyone relate to that? Or is it just me? <laughs> whenever there's pride, we always think we should have got more. Right? We're thinking that, you know, when are you going to realize how great I am? You know, come on, like, what's wrong with you? Like, you know, hurry it up. And there's always a dissatisfaction. So actually, this, this third verse is clearing the way for us to let go. Again, all that dissatisfaction, it's all part of that blazing fire of material existence. You look at people who don't have spiritual life, you see these patterns and trends. And what we're being given by the third verse of Shishashikam is the way out. This is how you get out of the blazing forest fire, which is burning everyone. And they don't even know why it's burning them. Right? So when we have this, this proper understanding of humility, 
it, it relates to gratitude. And then what Radha Maharaj said is that when there's humility, then whenever you receive anything, this, is, this, this really struck me. He said when there's proper humility, freedom from false ego, whatever is received is, all, is, is experienced as Krishna's causeless mercy and love. Now just think about what that means. It means that in our day-to-day -day life, if I'm able to put the false ego aside, if I'm, if I'm able to practice humility, which means to let go of this idea that I'm entitled, I deserve this, I demand that, this should happen to me, I couldn't do what I want. If I'm able to let that go, then whatever I experience, because I don't feel I deserve anything, so whenever I, I receive anything, that touches my heart. It's like, oh my God, Krish I don't deserve anything, but just look how kind Krishna is. And your, your entire consciousness and experience of devotional life is now changing. Yeah? Because whatever you're receiving, you don't feel you're entitled, therefore the heart becomes very, very full all the time. And, and even, this is, this is very important, and even when we receive things which seem like negative, the heart can still feel that that's Krishna's causes, mercy and love. When I was meditating on this point, I had some realization that when people add negativity towards us, every single person in our life who's ever had some kind of negativity or enmity towards us, we can understand that those individuals, they represent our previous incarnations. Okay? Think about this point very carefully. I'm going to repeat that because it can change the way we see everything. Anyone who's ever given us any difficulty in our, in our life, in any life, we can consider that those personalities are, are our own previous incarnations. Okay? Because the only way they're able to give us a hard time is because we did what? We did the same thing before. Yeah? And Prabhupada beautifully explains this. He says, that's why when he says, don't blame the instrument of your... Come, we've heard it before, but we didn't necessarily churn it. Do you see the point? Yeah? Those personalities, that's why this tolerance is so important that's being spoken of. And I love the point that was made earlier, because it's another feature of reality. There's, there's two types of individuals. One type feels, because of lack of humility, they always feel, I deserve more. And then there's the mentality that's being requested by this third verse. Right? I don't deserve anything. So whatever I receive, this is your kindness, Krishna. Huh? And even when there's difficulties, I understand that those difficulties, those people who give me difficulty, they're actually my friend. Now, that doesn't mean that I allow myself to be mistreated. Not, we're not talking about that at all. So we'll come back to the um, humility versus low self-esteem a bit later on. But I understand that the only reason why they can come into my life and cause me some difficulty it's because I've done something like that previously myself. The fact that I don't remember it, that's not the point. The Prabhupada was in a class and he was talking about reincarnation. And someone decided to challenge Prabhupada, right? Brave person. <laughs> so he decided to challenge Prabhupada. So what happened was, he was talking about reincarnation and the person you know, challenged Prabhupada, if reincarnation is real, why don't people remember all these things? Something along those lines. Prabhupada said, who said that? The person indicated. Prabhupada said, stand up. The person stood up. Prabhupada said, do you remember everything that you did when you were two years old? The person said, no. Prabhupada said, does that mean that you were never two years old? <laughs> the man said, no. Prabhupada said, sit down. <laughs> it's like that. Those personalities that so-called give us trouble, they're our previous incarnations. Therefore, tolerance. Tolerance. Yeah? And even if we, if we truly go deeper into our teachings, not only are they based upon what we've done before, but even then it's being minimized. Even then it is being minimized. Huh? So, part of the, the spiritual understanding of humility is exactly the point that Prabhupada often makes. Not a blade of grass moves without the will of the who? The Supreme Personality of God said. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, there are no accidents. Hmm? 
when I was meditating on this third verse, I realized it's, it's so interesting. Because this third verse relates to Nishta, and Nishta means what? It means one is steady, right? I realized that when you look at the statement of this third verse, if someone is humble and tolerant and so on, their mind will be steady. Yeah? You see how it works? It's a, everything is perfectly connected. It's perfectly connected. So, this matras pastas to kunteya shidosha sukha dukada, this cycle of happiness, you know, coming and going of happiness and distress, which are described as the coming and going of different seasons. That takes place for someone who's not cultivated this mentality. Huh? I'll be forced to go, I'll be elated when so called good things happen, and I'll be completely smashed when something negative happens. And I won't even see that those two things are two sides of the same coin. We can't have one without the other, materially. We can't have one without the other. It's not possible. Right? The person who's a bit, I was, in, um, I was in Brazil. So I was there for work. So we went to visit the temple. And it's interesting, I was staying in Sao Paulo, one place in Brazil. So I'm walking around and you see the houses, right? And it's very interesting. In the, the houses, many of the houses, they have like, um, they have their barriers and then there's barbed wire and there's spikes, you know, like that. And so, why do they have that? They're scared of what? Thieves, Thieves right? Someone's going to break in. So, it's, it's exactly that kind of understanding. So, I've amassed all this wealth. And the more I have, the more I'm fearful that it's going to be taken away. Two sides of the same coin. Huh? One comes with the other, right? And this is what it means by this duality. So if one practices this third verse of Shikshashtikam, the humility is there. The tolerance is there. And what's happening is, one is recognizing that we're, we're, we're allowing to ourselves to burn off. To burn off the previous activities that we've been engaged in through this devotional service. And therefore, by taking this mentality, I'm at, you're actually, we're receiving Lord Chaitanya's gift of steadiness. If we embrace this mentality, we're actually, and, and, this, and, and I say that with real, with real point, all of the teach, as far as I can see, practically all the teachings, they're gifts. Sometimes they always think it's an austerity, or they think it's this or that, but you'll find it's always a gift. You go deep into it, you'll find that what's being offered to us in the teachings is always much, much more than we, than we know. So many difficulties, challenges like here, if you just do this, we can remove all these issues from your life immediately. Immediately. Huh? There's, um, there's this idea of not becoming our enemy's enemy. Because then what happens is you're no longer implicated in the cycle. If they want to do that, that's their business. Now, this is important. This is another reason why people don't, like, why devotees were reluctant to practice. It's this point about the, the misunderstanding or the confusion between humility and low self-esteem. Okay? This is another reason why devotees often, we, and it's often subconscious, we fail to embrace the teaching. Yeah? So, let's just look at that. What is the difference between spiritual humility and low self-esteem. By the way, before we even get into that, is low self-esteem spiritual? No. So that's the first difference. Real humility is a spiritual concept which is favorable for one's spiritual life. Low self-esteem is actually unfavorable for one's spiritual life. So the first difference is that one, if we're looking at it from a devotional point of view, is spiritual and the other is actually material. So there are two different categories to begin with. But let's go further on. And again, the theme is, Removing the misconception so that we can with confidence and enthusiasm practice what's being given. Okay? So what is the difference between someone who's spiritually humble and someone who has low self-esteem? Know that these are sometimes misunderstood and therefore we don't want to practice what's being given here. What's the difference? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Okay. 
about. So, in the spiritual world, it's not question about self esteem. Sorry, no self esteem. Whereas in the material world, it's more about like, I have to get this position, that kind of concept. Yeah. So, let me just touch upon that. What you will find if we look deeper is whenever, it's come, whenever we're looking at this idea of low self-esteem, what we're really saying is that my value and my worth depends on something external to me. Right? And therefore, there's always insecurity. As long as my value is depending on something external to me, which I cannot control by the way, then what happens when that external thing changes? Where this, we actually lose it. You sometimes see this with celebrities. Today, everyone loves them, right? So they think that they're very wonderful. But have you ever noticed that sometimes think, things can change very quickly overnight? You've seen that. And then that same person who was praised today, now is completely criticized tomorrow, and they can be completely depressed. Because what Maya did was to get them to identify with something temporary and something flickering. So it's an insecure position. I saw a few other hands. What's the difference between humility and low self-esteem? Yes. Yes. Yeah, it, it can be there. I, I'll add a caveat to that. Humility, Prabhupada, it's very interesting. Bhagavad Gita, Prabhupada says humility means truthfulness. He actually writes that in one purple. And there's another place where Prabhupada writes in the Bhagavad Gita, humility means being free of the desire to be respected by others. He actually writes that. In the Bhagavad Gita as it is. So the point of humility means I recognize I'm not the doer actually. I no longer have the burden of thinking that everything has to turn out the way that I say it has to turn out. I know, I, not just know intellectually, I have an increasing degree of realization that there's someone else in charge and that person isn't me and, right, so first there's someone else in charge, two, that person isn't me and three, it's a good thing it's not me. Right? <laughs> It's that the person who's in charge knows everything, sees everything, and, and most importantly, the person who's in charge has my best interests at heart at all times. I want you to take a moment to think about that, because that can encourage us to let go. There's some, that this Krishna, who we're trying to build our relationship with, he loves you unlimitedly, more than we can conceive. So, this point that Bhaktivinoda Thakur makes in um, Harinam Chintamani, the Srup Lakshana of devotional service is Sharanagati, it's surrender. Right? If I understand that the person in charge has my best interests at heart, the natural conclusion would actually be to surrender to their plan. Does that make sense? Yeah? It is just like running into the loving embrace and the loving protection of, of an all-powerful parent. You know that there is shelter. There is shelter. And the beautiful thing is, this is, this is where it gets so interesting. A major difference between humility and low self-esteem is that with humility, with real spiritual humility comes fearlessness. Take that point to heart. With real spiritual humility comes fearlessness. Now I want to explain how this works. So, so we're the child and Krishna is that loving parent. Right? So, the humility of recognizing that he's in control, so all I have to do is follow his direction, knowing that I'm backed up by Krishna. So there's two things I feel. One is I always recognize that whatever's happening, it's because my parents are there. They're the ones paying for everything, they're the ones arranging everything. If I do anything good, they're the ones who gave me the direction as, as to how to do it. So therefore I'm humble because actually I know it's all coming from them. At the same time, I'm fearless because I know they're there protecting me. So the very, the very presence of Krishna that makes a devotee feel humble is the same presence that makes a devotee feel bold and completely confident. Do you see how it works? If we really have that understanding that, it's, that all I have to do is follow what Krishna says, I will simultaneously feel humble and at the same time bold. Huh? Akuta by doubtless and fearless. Fearless. Huh? 
Another, dif another distinction between humility and low self-esteem is when there's genuine humility, we're able to put Krishna into the center. Practically, what happens in many relationships, even amongst devotees, is we all come to the relationship and we're subtly pulling ourselves in the center. I'll give you an example. I knew one devotee couple, they were in a relationship. And the relationship didn't work out. And one, of the, you know, one side of the partnership, they were complaining to me, said, your friend has he's absolutely got no character. He's not a gentleman at all, right? And they explained that we were somewhere in the world and we were speaking late till night and he couldn't even be bothered to walk me back to where I was staying. That's what, that was the complaint. So I spoke to him about it. I said, so this is what was said. And he said, no, that's not true. He said, I asked the person. I said, I asked her, you know, um, he said, I asked her, do you want me to walk you back? She said, don't worry about it. That's what he said. So now I was getting very confused. Okay, so I went back to her and I said, this is, this, he said this. You know, he said, don't worry about it. And she said, yeah, but the way I was brought up, it is just a gentlemanly thing to do for the man to walk the woman back to where she's staying. That's what she said to me. I told him that. He said, yeah, but the way I was brought up, when a woman tells you to leave her alone, <laughs> you leave her alone, <laughs> you leave her alone. Now, it's funny, but it's also, it's, it's, it also symbolizes something. When there's no humility, or when there's a lack of humility, I'm in the center. And one of the subtle ways that I'm in the center is that whatever I expect, is, whatever I think is normal, right? I just expect everyone to know. Not only do I expect everyone to know, I expect everyone to know it. Right? They, they should know by now. Like he, she should know what he should know what I, what, what I want. I expect everyone to know. So I expect them to read my mind. Because I'm the center. My idea, it, it defines reality. That's the mentality of pride. I'm the center. So whatever standard I have, that's what everyone should do. Everyone should know. Because, because, I'm, because I am what? I'm who? I'm God. That's the idea. It's a subtle way of playing God. So I have this idea, I have all these conceptions in my mind and everyone should be able to do, everyone should do what I say. And whatever I can do, everyone should be able to do as well. That's another subtle kind of lack of humility. I define everything with myself as the reference point. You see? And then what happens as a result is I cause my own suffering. Uh, how does that work? Um, was it Devi Shaguna Mai? Mama Maya Duratyaya. Mama Vaya Prapadyante Mayam Etam Tarantite. Krishna has already explained to Arjuna and to all of us this material energy of mind consisting of the three modes of material nature is very difficult to overcome. Duratyaya. This idea that if I, if I tell everyone what to do, everything will work out, it's just, it doesn't work like that. In fact, the material energy will give us more trouble and it will. It, it, See, we have two options, really. We can, we can humble ourselves, or we can be humbled by life. Krishna, in this, Lord Chaitanya, in this third verse, because of his kindness, he's saying, look, why don't we work together? Right? Why don't we go on the program together? Why don't we cultivate the humility together? Rather than allowing the material energy to beat us down. Okay? That's, that's really what's being said here. There's an opportunity for us to get with the program. Right? To go with the flow, to go along with Krishna's plan. That's the point. And you will see, I, I, I promise you this, I you know, try to be conscious of this to some small extent. To the extent that we work on these things um, voluntarily and proactively, to that extent we're not beaten so much by the material energy because she has, Maya herself is Krishna's servant. So if she sees a devotee who's actually moving in the direction that her servant, that, that her master wants her to move in, or wants them to move in, she's like, great, you've got the point. You see, that's good. But it's our resistance which causes everything to be so much more difficult. And again, one who is at the stage of Nishta, they've got the, it means they've got the message. Right? It means they're a good student. They're on the course, doing the homework, right? reading the books, applying the, the, the teachings. They've actually understood, yes, this is what I'm meant to be practicing. 
I meant to practice humility. Humility means to put Krishna's agenda in the center, to recognize that his agenda is in the center, and then to act according to his agenda. Okay? And it's to recognize that sometimes we have these thoughts or ideas which are different from his agenda. Okay, okay, we should acknowledge that. That's the first stage. But now what can I do about it? I have seen in my own life, and I'm so grateful for this, I have seen in my own life again and again and again that when I'm struggling with something, if I just speak to the devotees, Krishna will give us the answer. Yeah? Oh shit, I, we were, I was with Chandra Mori Maharaj years ago, and I'm not sure Maharaj may remember this. There was a retreat, disciples retreat. At the end, I came to see him, the retreat had finished, I paid obeisances. I said, Maharaj, is there any instructions for me? And, and Maharaj said to me, and it blew my mind, because it was so amazing. He said to me, he said, Buddha Bhavna, you have to find new and innovative ways to share Krishna consciousness. And then Maharaj explained to me my mentality. He said, if you do this, he, said, he explained that if you don't do this, it'll kind of, it'll, it, you won't move forward in the way that you would otherwise move. And then, get, and then Maharaj explained to me this, uh, the analogy that Prabhupada gives of, of putting old wine in new bottles. Like that. Amazing. Again, why am I saying this? Because it relates back to this verse. The humility means I take myself out of the center. Humility means I recognize that Krishna is in the center. Humility means, as was said, I recognize my actual position, which I'm one ten thousand the size of the tip of the hair, and I'm in this material energy, which is very, very difficult to overcome. In other words, humility means I recognize that I need what? I need help. And therefore, then on that basis, I'm taking full advantage of all the teachings, I'm trying to study, I'm trying to learn, I'm asking, I'm inquiring. See, that humility leads to certain types of behavior. Do you, see, do you see what I'm trying to say? And the pride also leads to certain types of behavior. So this third verse is, 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 the, is, the, is the way towards spiritual freedom. The third verse represents nishta and, and it has so much practical application. If someone follows this third verse, immediately their relationship with the Vaishnavas improves. How do I say that? What do we say? We said Kanishta means one who is seeking Nishta, right? And we said that when one comes to, uh, when one gets to Nishta, it means what, what stage are they? Madhyam, okay? And what do we read in the lecture of instruction? It says the intermediate devotee, they're able to do what? They know how to relate to different people, right? They give mercy to the innocent, they avoid the envious, but they're always serving the pure devotee. Again, do you see how it's connected? Do you see how it's connected? It's all beautifully, it's like, and, and that's also proof that it's not, it's not, it's not a belief system. Because if it, was, if it was just made up, you couldn't have multiple different books, different aspects of the philosophy, and the entire thing synchronizes. Right? Anyone have any Apple products, like iPhones or laptops? It's like that, right? So you, you, you buy this Apple product and you've got your iPhone and it synchronizes with your laptop and it synchronizes with your watch and stuff like that. And then someone comes to you and says, you know that's a complete accident, don't you? You think this person's crazy. It's completely designed. So that means Krishna, he's arranging the realizations and the inspiration of all these different acharyas. Everything fits perfectly. Perfectly. And not just in one area of the teaching. I mean, you, you can find it again and again and again. The way the, the words which, which are used, the symptoms of the words, how one scripture relates to another scripture, how the two things synchronize, how one term relates to another term, all of these things is, is beautifully done. Beautifully done. We just have to follow it. I'm just going to check where I'm in terms of time. Okay, so... Eight minutes, eight minutes time, okay. Okay, what I will do... There's always more we can, we can say on this topic, but I don't want to also over, overload people. But I think we should give some time. There's two things I want to do then. The first thing I want, to, I want you to do is I want to do a little written exercise and we'll take questions, okay? So, to practically... I'm always interested in transformation. That's my big thing. I'm always interested in transformation. And what I've seen is the precursor to transformation is, is, a, is a deep and honest recognition of our current situation, okay? So in that regard, I'm going to ask you to answer the following questions. Now, what I'm going to ask you to 
put down an answer to you. You, you. It's up to you. If you want to share with people, you can. If you don't want to share with people, you don't have to. These are some markers or some ways to, to introspect and consider where am I in terms of some of these qualities, humility, tolerance, um, you know, honoring other people, not expecting to honor ourselves. So, let's start here. Write down, and, and, and there's, uh, I want us to be as honest with ourselves as possible. So what you write down, again, you, 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 there's, no, there's no expectation of showing other people, and I'm saying that so you'll put down the truth. Okay, let's start here. When, when I see other devotees being honored and respected, how do I feel? And when I say devotees, by the way, I mean devotees who appears like that, not, guru, not your Guru Maharaj, you know, like, because that, that doesn't count, you know, because everyone's like, oh, Guru Maharaj. When it's your peers, your devotees in your circle, I, just write it down. When I see other devotees, my peers, you know, juniors, being honored and respected, how do I feel? Just write that down. That's question number one. Mm. To what extent do I naturally think about, I'm going to use the word natural very specifically, to what extent do I naturally think about and consider other people in my interactions, especially the welfare of other people? So, for example, we're going for Prashadam. Not at the festival, by the way, because I've noticed that festivals, people are on best behavior, right? So not at festivals. I'm talking about how you are normally, in your local temple. It's prashadam time, you know, to what extent do I consider, or even, am I even aware of other people? To, is, to what extent is that normal for me, okay? And I'm talking about other devotees, again, not your family or close loved ones, no. Just normal interaction with devotees. So when I'm going for prashadam, do I think, okay, let me get to the Maha before she does, because, you know, she likes to take a big plate and, you know, there may be nothing left for me, that kind of thing. What am I thinking? To what extent, to what extent does my natural pattern of thinking include and even consider other people? Okay. That's, um, yeah, it's a question. Okay. And then maybe we'll put one more. Yeah. Third question. How do I... What is my natural reaction when people deal with me in a way that I don't like? Yeah, so what goes, what goes on inside me? Yeah. There's a beautiful pastime with Srila Prabhupada and I don't know the context but some, some persons were you know, interacting in a, let's say, not favorable way towards Prabhupada and Prabhupada said, I must have done something, to them in the, something wrong to them in their previous life. And Prabhupada is sinless. But that humility, that mood, is a very, very natural thing for a pure devotee. It is said that with pure devotees, it's not a question of forgiveness. They don't even take, the, take offense in the first place. It's, it's something very, very special. Very, very special. So those three questions to think about, okay? And it's not to condemn anyone, it's just to see, it's to become more sensitive and introspective. What tends to go on inside me? Yeah. The one last thing I'll share before we open up for questions is a beautiful way of understanding the mood of spiritual humility is Rupa Goswami's Ashabanda prayers. Um, in the, it's in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu 1335. So Rupa Goswami uh, he begins, Na prema shravanadi bhakti apiva. He says, Na prema, I don't have love of God yet. Shravanadi bhakti apiva. I don't have love for the process of shravanam, kirtan, and hearing, chanting, etc. And you're going to say, I don't have a high birth, I don't have mystic abilities, and so on. He says, But because you, dear Lord, give your mercy to the most fallen, I have this unbreakable hope which is always in my heart. This hope is always giving me pain. So the spiritual humility is, it has two elements to it. One feels that one does not have anything. But at the, so that's the, that's the sense of my small insignificance before Krishna. Okay, I'm, I feel insignificant before Krishna. So it's not low self-esteem. One feels insignificant because they recognize Krishna's greatness. 
And at the same time, they also recognize about Krishna what? That because you, dear Lord, give your mercy to the most fallen. In other words, because you have such, unbound, such boundless love, um, you know, consideration, beauty, good qualities, care for everyone, including me, because you have love for me and everyone, there's always a hope. And if I try to follow you, you will help me just as you would help anyone else. Huh? In other words, Samoham Sava Bhuteshu. As Krishna tells Arjuna, I'm equal, kind, and merciful to everyone. Huh? So it's a simultaneous, you know, where, you, you know, let's say you have some, you've saved a little bit of money. You're thinking, I'm pretty good, I'm, I've got something. Then, you're, then someone turns up who's a billionaire, right? So now your money seems insignificant based upon what that person has. But then that billionaire says, I want to help you. Okay? So you simultaneously have a sense of how little that you have in contrast to the billionaire, but at the same time, if he's going to bankroll your business, hey, we're going to make some dough. Okay, you understand how it works? So it's simultaneously that sense of insignificance, but at the same time, great enthusiasm, utsahan. So that, so that again, the whole thing comes together. And that's where it differs from low self-esteem. When low self-esteem, it's another way of playing God. I don't have this, I don't have that, no one speaks to me like this, no one speaks to me like that, no one likes me, I don't get attention, all this, it's just me, 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 and more me. And therefore, that low self-esteem, the, differ the differentia differentiation is that with humility, it causes someone to be enthusiastic and, and bold and proactive to get Krishna's mercy. Knowing that, I know that if I try my best, he's already promised he'll help me like he'll help anyone else. So, there's no loss, right? If I can try my best with, with people in this material world, by definition, I should, be willing, I should be ready to try even harder with someone who's more loving and more perfect than the people of this, this material world. Because the people of this material world, they can easily, things can be misunderstood. You may work very hard and people may not even recognize your work, right? Or you may work very hard and the person recognizes your work, but now they've lost their job, they've lost their money, they can't help you. So before they promise, I'll help you out, but, but they're dependent. So if something happens to them, they, all they can do is say, oh, I'm sorry, I really wanted to help you, but now the situation has changed. But what's the difference? Krishna, unlimitedly powerful, unlimitedly loving, can see everything. So if we're going to put some, if we're going to cooperate with people in this world, how much more we should cooperate with Krishna? How much more? It just, it's just logical. It just makes logical sense. Huh? So, low self-esteem, one becomes inactive. While thinking oneself to be the center, one becomes inactive. Low self-esteem is actually a symptom of the mode of ignorance. But spiritual humility is coming of, of the higher, of the, actually of the, in a pure state, is Shuddha Sattva. Hope against hope. And you see this beautifully, this is the last point, then we'll have questions. You see this beautifully in the, in the prayers of Shuddha Prabhupada. It's such, a, it's such a beautiful case study. And again, you see how everything fits together. So when Prabhupada is in the Jaladuta, he's, he's, he has these prayers. How will they understand this teaching? He doesn't think, Krishna, I'm great. I can do it, you know? You, you pick the right guy. It doesn't, it's not like that. He's actually had that move, but he has to move. But you see, what's interesting, he's still coming to the West. He's still coming to the West, and he's asking Krishna, how are they going to understand this message? He's already explaining the press. This Western world is, uh, is completely engrossed in these lower modes. How they can understand this? And then he says what? He says, Krishna, you, you're the one who put them into, into the prison. You have to release them. Isn't that beautiful? Right? It's again the idea that I'm going to be your instrument. You've asked me to come, I'm going to come. You've asked me to try my best, I'm going to try my best. But I know that I can't do it. But if you use me as your instrument, everything is possible. Everything is possible. Okay, so we'll stop there and let's just see because I know I don't, I'm going to be careful about it.